Let me say that uh, even aside from conflict zones, we have a, a more basic problem, which is that education requires financing, and poor countries just don't have the finance on their own to be able to provide an education for all of the children. And so the result is conflict, no conflict, AI, no AI. We've got hundreds of millions of kids out of school, and even those that are in school are in under-resourced schools so that they're not learning very much. And this is a, a phenomenal crisis. Education should not just be for the elite. Education is so fundamental for human well-being, so fundamental for economic development, so fundamental for the basic functioning of society that we have to ensure truly, not only as a slogan, but truly that every child is in school and every child is learning. We're not doing that. AI should be able to help us to do that because now with online education and with AI tools, we can reach more children at lower cost. But the truth is that any effort of education requires a lot of social organization, a lot of government determination, and a lot of financing. And in general, we have not lived up to this challenge. The rich countries just haven't cared about education in the poor countries. This is the basic sad fact of our world. It is indeed a very sad fact. So I would like to touch upon three things. First, let's dive deeper into technology. What are the challenges in implementing technology-based education solutions in conflict zone? And how can we ensure these solutions are sustainable and adaptable for the long term? I'm going to continue to uh, emphasize that conflict zones, of course, make everything worse. But even without conflicts, we are not solving basic education issues. The main obstacle is poverty. And even in countries that aren't poor, inequality, where the rich just don't care enough to pay taxes or to enable the government to extend education to everybody. So there are many reasons why we're not living up to what we need Extreme poverty for me is heartbreaking and obvious. Conflicts are devastating because usually they could be ended if we really tried in a just way to end them quickly. And within societies, there's a lot of injustice. Minority groups don't get to get go to school or the rich don't want to pay taxes to help the poor. So there are many, many obstacles. And again, if you think about it from the point of view of an individual child, a child without an education today has no future. This is a sad reality. <laughs> what kind of job is there in this world without education? Nothing but backbreaking labor or some terrible life uh, that. Uh, we don't wish for, for any child. When it comes to using technology to overcome these problems, all of the same issues that have been barriers for normal education remain. For example, in many poor countries, there aren't schools. Or if there are schools, there's no electricity in the schools. Or if there is some electricity once in a while in the schools, there's no connectivity for devices, or if there is connectivity, if there's a base station someplace, there are no computers, or the kids don't have devices. So to say that education is going to solve it, I'm sorry, that technology is going to solve it, is basically to say, yes, we will systematically close all the gaps right now. And that's true whether we're doing it with technology or whether we're doing it with a teacher in a classroom that has a solar panel on the roof and uh, is uh, providing education for the children. Either way, we have to have an organized approach that starts from the premise 
that it's unacceptable for children to be out of school. So let's then touch on this uh, organized approach. So in practical terms, what global policy shifts would you recommend? Oh, can everyone hear us? Yeah. <laughs> in practical terms, what global policy shifts would you recommend to ensure education remains a priority in conflict, in time of conflict and in, conf in times of no conflict? The first thing I would do is I would like to educate our leaders to tell them that they don't do their job because our governments are so good at war, but they're terrible at peace. I'm going to start with my own country. It spends a trillion dollars on the military. It's engaged in wars all over the world. And when it comes to children's education abroad in poor countries, you'll have half our Congress saying, why should we waste our money on other people? You know, they, they want to spend a trillion dollars on wars, but the idea that they would spend it on children is something that they don't understand. So the first thing I'd like to do is educate our leaders why this is so fundamental and just to be decent people. That's uh, maybe, maybe the first point. But then the problem is, and I'm in this business, if I could put it this way, for 40 years I deal with finance ministers. If I say to a finance minister, Mr. Minister, education's really important in your country. You really should make sure there's a budget. He'll look at me like I'm crazy. Are you, are you ignorant, Mr. Sachs? Do you think I could afford to have all the children in school? And we would go through the numbers. Mm -hmm. And when we go through the numbers, we would find that education is beyond his budgetary means. Now, here's an interesting issue. That finance minister will go to Washington mm -hmm. because poor country. He'll go to the International Monetary Fund. Do you think when he goes to the International Monetary Fund that anyone there will say to him, Mr. Minister, we really want to help you make sure that all your children are in school. He'll never hear that. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. He'll never hear that. What he'll hear is balance your budget. Keep your spending down. Don't have inflation. But the idea that somebody should help this minister of a poor country to find the resources to have all the children in school, that will be the revolution that comes that will change the world to make the world decent. Because when a finance minister goes to the IMF, the first thing the IMF should say is, ah, Mr. Minister, let's have a seat. Are your kids in school? No. Oh, we've got to do something about that. Do you have health care? No. Oh, well, we've got to do something about that. Do you have electricity for all? No. Oh, but that's SDG 7. We've got to do something about that. That's the revolution that we need, that somebody cares. The reason that they don't care, by the way, is that if you expose the financing gap, then somebody has to fill it. And then they'll turn to the United States and say, oh, you're a big, rich country. Why don't you help fill it? And the United States will say, why should we help fill it? We don't care. And that's the problem. <laughs> and so this is where we're stuck in this world. We can't yet get an agreement to be decent. We have many goals. We've set all these objectives. We have all these processes, but we don't get to the bottom line, which is that Innate, in order to enable people in poor countries or in crisis zones to function, we have to solve problems. When it comes to poverty, we have to help provide finance. When it comes to conflict zones, we have to stop the wars. So these are the two points that are uh, critical. So is it fair if I summarize it as we need to educate the policymakers and we need to make sure that they care more? This is a problem that philosophers have worried about for about 2,300 years because Plato asked the question, how do we get decent leaders? And he wrote a book about it uh, 2,300 years ago called The Republic. And the idea was he tried to figure out, he was the greatest philosopher of his age, he tried to figure out what should we do? And he said, well, we have to raise the people who are going to be the leaders in, in an appropriate way so that they have good values, so that they have virtues, and they can't own any property, said Plato. They have to live decently, but they can't own any individual property, otherwise they'll be corrupted. 
So this is something that he already worried about more than two millennia ago. But to be serious for us today, most people want to do the right things. Most people in the world want sustainable development and a decent life for all children, not only for their own children. But most, many leaders, unfortunately in my country, many leaders think that their job is uh, to make themselves rich or to make their country rich and not to worry about the rest of the world. And that really is our biggest challenge right now. I hear you. And I think we hear you all very clearly. Let us um, talk now about different mechanisms, financing mechanisms. Sure. So what are some of sustainable education finance mechanisms in area expert, like in conflict zone and beyond conflict zones? Um, and more, I, I would say, more globally in the, so in the global south, how can these funding models balance the immediate needs of education um, and making sure that there is reconstructions and rebuilding? Yeah, I, I spend a lot of time with spreadsheets, meaning I look at how much things cost and what the budget should be. And there are two points that I want to emphasize about the budget of education in a low-income country. In a poor country, typically the population is a very young age. Uh, usually there's a high fertility rate and uh, rapid population growth and a lot of children. So you have a lot of children that need to be in school relative to the size of the population. That's the first issue. That's why it's expensive. Second, there are very few qualified teachers, and their salaries are much higher than the average salary. So if you look at the cost of education, not in an absolute number, like number of dollars, but in relative to the average wage in the population, it's rather expensive in a low-income country. So the budgetary outlays that you need are usually well beyond 10% of national income. And that's usually more than half the total budget, which is why it's unaffordable. So we need a way to make education affordable, even in those places. Here's the good news. Mm -hmm. Think of educating a child just from a purely financial point of view, that you pay for the teachers and the schools, you put the child through 12 years of primary and secondary education, you enable the child to go to maybe three or four years of tertiary education. Think of that as an investment. And then ask, what is the return to that investment? Well, if you compare the child that leaves school after six years with the child that gets a university education, say, if you look at the salary gain for that child, which is a kind of measure of the productivity gain of that child, the return is phenomenal. It's a great investment. It's about 20% rate of return. So, boy, you want to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, the child's family can't say, no problem, I'll go to the bank and I'll borrow and I'll invest in my child because they're poor. Their bank can't do it. Their government can't do it. But if we could get financing to that government at decent terms, say three or 4% interest rate, and on a 40-year loan, I would say to the government, borrow to ensure that all the children are in school because later on you'll be a much richer economy and you'll be able to pay back that loan. So what I've been advocating for 20 years is that we increase the amount of official financing so that governments have the means to carry out what they need to carry out. And this is quite feasible in education because the returns to education, financial returns, not just human returns, but financial returns are very high. But 40 years it takes to get the returns because you have to educate the child, they have to go to the labor market, they have to earn a higher income, then it pays off. And so what happens if a government goes and borrows a seven-year loan like they're told to do? 
well, when that loan is due in seven years, the child's in eighth grade. <laughs> you know, there's no return yet. And so the government goes bankrupt before the return actually occurs. So we need long-term, high-quality financing. And then when we have that, then all the questions that you are seeking about and answers about artificial intelligence, digital connectivity, and so on, all become possible. Because then when the money's there, a creative education minister could say, oh, I'm going to get all the schools online. I'm going to have a master class uh, so that uh, all the students can learn you know, calculus because we have a great teacher in the capital, but not in, uh, in the provinces. Mm -hmm. But we'll have the connected classroom. So many things could be done, but you need the resources to do them. So on that note, just last September, from your segment from Educate a Child lecture series, you said, and I'm quoting you, educating a child in dollar and cents term offers the highest return in terms of skills. That's what you just discussed, labor productivity and societal investment. This requires a 20-year investment and then in 20-year re the return. We need at least $50 billion a year for SDG4. We need connectivity, we need devices, water, electricity, hardware, local languages, and a budget. We need Apple, Google, Reliance, and others to contribute. No more pilot project. And Dr. Sachs, I couldn't agree more. We need to do this at scale. UNESCO, UNICEF, Global Partnership for Education, UNCHR, and other organizations need to lead with a call for a reality. The reality is every child needs to be in school. That's what we pledge, um, and it's the only thing that makes sense, and in the code. So my question, Dr. Sachs, so, can the Global Health Fund be replicated for education, and why has that not happened yet? Because I know that you have been advocating for a similar fund. Why are we not able to bring in an education global fund? Well, 23 years ago, uh, Kofi Annan and uh, Dr. Gru Brundtland asked me to help set up a special fund for health, which became the global fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. Mm -hmm. And I remember writing out the plans for that and advocating not $50 billion a year at the time, but about $5 billion a year, saying this will save a lot of lives. Mm -hmm. And there were so many naysayers. Oh, you can't do this. The money will be wasted. It will be stolen. Uh, people don't know how to take their medicines. Every excuse possible was given. But Kofi Annan was a great, great man. And uh, Dr. Brundtland is one of the greatest uh, states people, states persons uh, of our age. And they made it happen. And that global fund has saved tens of millions of lives because it really worked. Now, it's a puzzle to me. When it started to work, I went around. I said, I told you so. Mm -hmm. I said to the governments, I told you this would work. There are many skilled people around. They want to make it work. You should do the same thing with education. No response. And so it has been a mystery to me why health got some attention though you know when it comes to health rich people say oh we better maybe we better help poor people because otherwise we'll catch it you know maybe there's a little bit of self-interest there i don't really have a full explanation but what i would say to world leaders what i do say every day is we can't afford a planet in which the children are not in school there is no greater investment, literally. It's not just a slogan. It's not just morals. Try to run a society with uneducated people. Try it. <laughs> it doesn't work. Your society will fall to pieces. You won't have jobs. You won't have investment. You won't have infrastructure. You won't have peace. And so we've got to do this. $50 billion a year may seem like a big number, it's actually not a, not a big number at all. I like to remind people the world economy, that is what is produced in a year, is $100 trillion. $100 trillion. So that means that 
$100 billion is one-tenth of 1% 1 of output. Now, I would ask the people listening, could the world afford one-tenth of 1% 1 of the output to make sure that every child is in school? I think the question answers itself. What could be more obvious? And yet, oh, come to Washington. You'll meet a lot of really, I shouldn't, I won't use the word. But anyway, come to Washington and you'll meet a lot of interesting people. I'll use that adjective. Uh, who won't understand why to spend one-tenth of one percent of uh, world output for children. And then we, can, uh, then we can go figure out what's wrong with this world. <laughs> Dr. Sachs, as an ex-Washingtonian, I'm actually very oh, pleased thank you. you call <laughs> them out on this podcast. But can I say something? Yes. Say, I don't know what's... I couldn't figure out that puzzle. Can I... Is it because health is big pharma and education, uh -huh. is, not as, and education is not as lucrative? That's a, such an interesting and good idea. That this is part of it for sure. Although I wouldn't say big pharma was the biggest champion of things at the beginning. But the fact that there were companies around probably said, yes, we could get those products from. And I remember I was in those discussions telling those companies, you have to sell your product at cost, not at 100 times markup. But the fact that there were the companies there made a difference. But we've got big tech companies. So we, these big tech companies should, they're so rich. We can't even imagine how rich they are. Uh, so Google or... Uh, big companies don't take risk in poorer countries because the risk is higher. I don't want them to take risk. I want them to do their job. Of investments. Yeah, I mean, I hear you. I want them to do their job. I mean, their human job. Google wants to organize knowledge on this world. Okay, education's part of that. I would say to Google, I, I know I knew I know the leaders of Google. Come on, choose a couple countries, show you operate at scale, show you can get every kid in school in a couple of years. And they yet, could do it. And yet it's not happening. It's not quite happening yet. Don't give up. You gotta keep pushing because suddenly the door opens and, and you walk through it. Okay, well, let's, you hear Dr. Sachs, let's continue being hopeful. It is really difficult at times to be hopeful, uh, but yeah, absolutely. So I don't want us to... I think the world's changing in a, in a better way, actually. I really do. I, I mean that seriously, not just to uh, cheer people up, but the world's changing. One of the things that's happening is here we are in Doha, in this wonderful conference. Okay, that's, that's a wonderful thing. You know, it's not in Washington, by the way. They can't figure out how to have it in Washington, but we have it here. The world is becoming much, much more multipolar. It doesn't depend on London or Washington anymore. God forbid. Now, there's so many more places where people can do things, take leadership, make action. And this is the most hopeful point that we're not depending on a couple of places, a couple of greedy places. We're depending on our own will and activity in a, in a world that has much, much more capacity all over the world. I concur. Whether we would like to recognize it or not, but the word order is changing. Absolutely. And I think all for the good, by the way. That's my feeling. So let us... Um just two, two concluding thoughts. Um, reflecting on your extensive experience in the intersection of policy, education, and innovation, what gives you hope about the future of education? What gives me hope is that we have so many wonderful ways to learn and to teach right now. And I get online in the morning and I'm able to give classes all over the world. This was something unimaginable a few years ago. We have our students connected to students all over the world for free on Zoom uh, in a wonderful way. Uh, we have knowledge at our fingertips like never before. My God, if we want to pursue education and knowledge and cultural appreciation and uh, 
co-learning with people in different parts of the world, we can do things that were unimaginable just a few years ago. Absolutely. And then finally, what message would you like to convey to global leaders? And I would like you here to be as vocal as possible, <laughs> not only because this is the podcast that we're hoping that um, will be heard by many, but also because I know that there are a few world leaders, I mean, a few leaders representing their countries with us today. What would be your message to them and to policymakers about the role of education in shaping a more resilient and for God's sake, equitable world? A week ago, I was invited to speak to the UN Security Council, and I really uh, cherished the opportunity, and I told them that every one of these wars right now could end immediately, even within the UN Security Council, if they did their job properly. Mm -hmm. Today, we could have a state of Palestine announced and become a member of the United Nations. Today. That's been in every resolution. Why don't they vote it today? Why doesn't the United States stop blocking something like that? Why don't we get real solutions every to each of these wars? The war in Ukraine would stop today if NATO agreed to stop trying to expand to Ukraine because that's why we have a war in Ukraine. We, today, I would like to stop all the wars and tomorrow I would like to use the savings and get the kids in school. It's as simple as that.